So when I was growing up, I, uh, my family and I were farm workers. Uh, I was a farm worker from the age of five to the age of 19. That was my first career. Uh, it was a very illustrious career, I call it. I learned a lot about working hard uh, and valuing family and uh, a lot of other things that I, I use today. And my family would come from Mexico. We're actually from a state, Jalisco, uh, every May and then leave in December after the crops were done. And one of the stories that I remember being told when I was in Mexico is this story of the Virgin Mary appearing to Juan Diego, the Virgin of Guadalupe. It, you know, this miracle happened in Mexico City. They built a, a big cathedral and, and the miracle, you know, continues on hundreds of years, you know, being talked about. And, you know, I'm not here to talk about whether this miracle indeed happened or not. I mean, there's controversy right around it. And, and some people believe it, some people don't. But I can tell you that in the world of investments, there is absolutely no miracles that happen. And, you know, I want to start with that because I think a lot of people view investing as a, as a you know, there's a secret to making money. There's some, you know, deal that's out there that you can really hit it out of the park. And, and we don't really believe that. We, uh, we think that uh, you, you get what you pay for. There, are, are, there is no free lunch in the world of investments. And if you think about creating wealth, uh, we think, you know, that based on our experience with our clients, that people make a lot of money by focusing on two things. One is they have one activity, one investment that really makes, generates all of their, their money uh, or most of it, right? Most of their wealth. And we have a client that, for example, owned a, you know, a, a part of a, a publicly traded company and he made millions of dollars from that as being a tech entrepreneur. We have another one that is focused on, you know, starting a business in, in the financial services industry. And he spends most of his time there trying to make that work. And, you know, I know we're, we're talking to doctors uh, in, the, in the Latino community. And I think for doctors, it might be your practice and your, and your service in that space. You, most of that money, most of the wealth will be generated by focusing on that. And then it's a combination of that one focused activity with other diversified investments that allow you to manage and grow it and protect that wealth. And so what what a, what a lot of times happens is people think that, you know, there's these things that are out there that are miracles that are going to make you tons of money and really take you out of poverty or out of middle class, whatever the the social class that you're thinking of. But really, it's not about that framework. And in our mind, it's you have one thing that you're good at, that you'll make a lot of money, just like Donald Trump focuses on real estate, Warren Buffett focuses on stocks, that will generate most of the wealth. And the other stuff that you're doing on the investments should be to diversify that wealth. And this is what today's discussion is about. It's about how do you take your wealth that you created or you're creating and you diversify it and manage it? as opposed to trying to find some miracle in secret. So the goal of investing in our minds is to achieve the highest return. And I say net return, which I mean after taxes and after fees for the risk that you incur. So it's not about making the most money. It's not about achieving the highest return. It's really a, a ratio of return to risk. Uh, and let me go down and explain that a little bit further. Let's, let's talk about return. Return really is uh, best explained by a simple rule called the rule of 72. The rule of 72 is very simple. If you take 72 and you divide that by the interest rate or investment return, annual investment return that you achieve in an investment, it'll tell you approximately the number of years that it will take to double your money. So, for example, if you're putting your money in the bank at 1%, and that's pretty aggressive, actually, it's really hard to get 1% these days, but assume you could get 1%, it would take you 72 years to double your money. So, putting $5,000 in would take you 72 years to reach $10,000. If you put it in something that has 4%, 18 years, and it has something that has 8% a year, it'll take you nine years. Now, the concept is simple. Money makes money. And the higher the interest rate, the, the faster you're going to be able to compound that, 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 those dollars and, and, and create wealth. 
And so, you, you know, the investing is about trying to get into this 8%, 4% range and, and away from this 1%. Uh, and mathematically, it works out. I'm not going to go through the math, but the rule of 72 is a, is a good way to illustrate how return works for you. Let's talk about risk, because again, the, the goal of investing is highest return per unit of risk. So the best way to think about risk in our mind, and we illustrate to our clients, is to think about what would have happened from 1928 to 2013 if you had invested your money in all U.S. stocks, in a portfolio of diversified U.S. stocks. Let's call it the S&P 500. The worst one-year return was in 1931, which is minus 44%. So when you think about investing in U.S. stocks, what we like to tell our clients is assume that in a one-year period, your money might be down about half. You got a million dollars to invest and you put it all in U.S. stocks. Next year, you could see that amount to be 500000 If you're not okay with that risk, then you should not be investing in stocks or you should reduce your investments in stocks. But think about what happens if you invested over a 30-year period. Well, what's the worst consecutive 30-year return on an annualized basis, on a per-year basis? Well, it's actually happened in 1957. So 1927 to 1957, that's 30 years. The worst return is an 8% annual return. So the, the I mean, it, 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 going back to the rule 72, the worst possible return would have been doubling your money every nine years. Now, this assumes no taxes and no fees, which is unrealistic, but it gives you a sense that time is one of the most important factors in reducing risk. Because the longer you can wait, the less likely that you will experience a return of negative 45% and negative 50. Now, this is based on history. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. Uh, maybe it's less than 8%, but we do know that it's a reasonable bet to assume that if you can hold off for 30 years, put an investment down, hold off, you're less likely to uh, lose on the principle that you, that you put forth. Welcome, Daniel. Uh, let's think about asset classes. So people typically invest in real estate, or one of these three asset classes, stocks, bonds, or cash. Now I'm gonna talk about real estate. It's a, it's a very good um, investment class. Uh, I know a lot of doctors put their money there and that's reasonable. Uh, just to illustrate this concept of risk and reward, I wanna talk about stocks, bonds, and cash. So from left to right, you have highest risk, lowest risk. And it, many of you saw the, the stock market tank this, this week. Um, Couple, last couple of days has been rough. If you were to look at how bonds did, you would have seen a lot of green uh, relative to the stocks that were a lot of red. So bonds tend to be negatively correlated to stocks. So when people are running away from stocks, running away from risk because they're scared, they tend to bid up bonds, US bonds in particular. So, you know, when you're thinking about the portfolio, one of the most significant decisions that you will make in investing, one that will drive probably 90% of your return is what mix of these building blocks you'll have in your portfolio. So for example, if you're aggressive, you might have more in stocks, 74%, 25% is as an example. And as you get more conservative, you'll have more in the bond category and less in the stock category. And you know, it is the most, the first and in our mind, the most important decision uh, of investing is what is your mix? What is your asset allocation? And that drives a lot of, uh, of what you're going to see in your return. So I want to I want to talk about how we think about investing in, in terms of buckets. And I have four quadrants here. I labeled them just like in the math. Uh, the, the, the way the, the, the numbers work here, one, two, three, and four from right to left and then down. And I'm going to talk about each one of these and how to think about how you would do an asset allocation on each one of these quadrants. 
Okay. So let's talk about quadrant one, which is long-term investments. So this is things like retirement, college education. Uh, maybe you want to save for some financial freedom, which in our mind means not having to work because you're making passive income uh, to cover your expenses. And this is typically 15 years plus, um, 30 year plus. Uh, and it's really, we see this in some taxable accounts. Uh, a lot of our clients have that, that have small businesses have their money uh, in SEP IRAs, uh, traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs, 401ks, money that you don't intend to touch for a long period of time. And again, if you think about the factor, the risk is really reduced uh, the, the longer you can wait. So a typical asset allocation could be something like this, 74% stocks, 24%, 25% bonds, because you can afford to take that risk uh, over that long period of time, because this is, this is your long-term money. And uh, clients will have their retirement accounts, and they also have like a taxable brokerage account that say, you know what, I'm not going to touch that. I'm going to contribute to it 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks a month, and that's going to be 15, 20 year money. This is the best kind of money. This is the one that's going to yield the highest results, hopefully. Let's talk about the contra investments. So we, we want to bring this up because when we think about high interest debt, like a credit card uh, that's charging you 15, 20 percent uh, or uh, student loans that are 7 percent, that to us is it's an investment. It's a contra investment by paying off something that's charging you 10% a year in interest, you are essentially making a risk-free investment of 10% a year. By, by avoiding that 10% per year of interest expense, you are, it's the same thing as earning 10% on an investment. And so when we talk to our clients and we see high interest debt, whether it's credit card or student loans or something else, we really emphasize paying that off first because there is no better return to risk ratio than paying off debt. Um, if you if you remember, the average return of stocks has been about 8%, but that's with huge volatility, right? You could be down 44%, you could be down 30%, and, and, and it's very uncertain. If you pay off your debt, it's absolutely certain that you'll earn that uh, interest back. And that you'll essentially make a you know a return on your money, and so we we recommend having a cash bucket that they put their money in, and it's it's used to pay off these contra investments, credit card debt, and so forth. So then, once that's done, one of the things that we recommend to our clients, and we see them do, is something called a liquidity investment bucket. So this is short term money. Uh, a clients want to save for a down payment, a car purchase, maybe they want to go get their MBA. And so they, they, they want to have money and, and they realize that cash is a big drag on their investment return. And so they, they want to put some money to work, but they don't want to be risky because if you call, it could be, if you put it all in the stock market, you know, things could be down in a year. So, uh, Typically, we see a taxable brokerage account at E-Trade. We, we use Charles Schwab for our clients, and they'll set that up, and they'll put something like this as an allocation, 90% bonds, 10% stocks. Now, a portfolio like this would probably yield around 3 or 4%. And the best part is, or the important part is, that such a portfolio is probably not going to go down more than, say, 5% in a given year, maybe 10% at the worst. And that's a reasonable risk to take uh, with that short-term money, especially if you're funding it every month. So this is the liquidity investment bucket that you know you're going to need the money, but you don't want to have, say, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 in cash because it's really earning you know, half a percent, something like that. It, it doesn't make any sense. And so this is a you know, controlled risk uh, portfolio that could, could uh, help out. Um, not guaranteed, of course, like anything else, but it's it's useful in in that perspective. Mm -hmm. And then you have safety investments, right? So this is for emergency cash, uh, you know, I guess medical payments, right? There are doctors in the house, and and more importantly, uh, for us that are married and 
have spouses is peace of mind and 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 peace in the fa- in the in the household. Uh, we have a, a client that has two years worth of expenses saved up in uh, emergency in the emergency in the safety investment bucket because she's scared that she might need that money. Right? Uh, we have other clients that say, you know what, I'm highly employable, uh, making money. The chance of me getting fired is low. I'm going to have three months worth of expenses. So it uh, saved up. And and so this bucket is, is typically put into something like a checking account. We like internet banks like Immigrant Direct or Dollar Savings Direct. Uh, Capital One 360 is another one that comes to mind. These are banks that uh, will yield half a percent, 0.75%. But the money is protected by the by the FDIC up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars per account holder. So it's it's nice, right? It's it, you know it's safe and you can actually get it out quickly and don't have to lose worry about the principal. Mm-hmm. Now you could put a little bit of a in in the bond category since you know bonds don't shift that much, but very very little because you really want uh, that peace of mind. Mm-hmm. So I, we talked about asset allocation. The mix of stocks, bonds, and cash is the most important decision that you will be making. So once you arrive at that decision, depending on which bucket you're filling, right, how do you select the investments inside of each of those categories? Well, let me give you, again, try to give you a framework. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of issues. One is, do you want to bet against the markets or do you want to bet with the markets? Mm -hmm. Do you want to do this yourself or do you want to outsource it to someone like us or somebody else? Um, and the thing that gets us more excited is what are you paying for the, the decision to select investments? So let me give you a flavor for each one of those components. So let's talk about betting against the market. So let's think about the world stock market. So right now, if you were to visit Vanguard's website, Vanguard.com, you could find a ETF, exchange traded fund. Don't worry about what that is for now. But it's an instrument that you can purchase uh, with the symbol Victor Tom VT that invests essentially in every single stock that's traded in the entire world. Right. So last year to date through September 30th, the entire world, the average of the entire world stock market has yielded about three and a half percent. And this is what it, this is what the world looks like. About half of the world is made up of U.S. stocks, and that's I'm showing like what the U.S. stock market return year to date. It's your turn seven percent. And again, this is nine thirty, right? It's a lot lower, you know, for the last couple of days. But it gives you a sense. The developed market, places like Europe, Japan, has returned about minus one point six percent, and it makes up about forty two percent of the world stock market. The emerging markets like India, China, uh, Brazil make up about 9% of the world. So if your portfolio, if your stock portfolio looks different than what's on the right, then you are betting against the market. And I'll give you an example. A lot of U.S. investors will have 100% of their money in U.S. stocks. And you know what? That has worked out great. But the idea is that by putting 100% of your money in U.S. stocks, you are making a bet against the world market and you're saying that the international stocks are going to do poor or worse than the U.S. ones. Now, that's a bet you want to make. That's fine, but you should be aware of that, that you're betting against the the average world investor uh, by doing that. So that's the first decision. Do you bet against the market or do you bet with the market? If you wanted to bet with the market, you could buy something like this Everything else is betting against the market, and there's an additional level of risk that you're taking by going against the, what the world says. So let's talk about fees. One of the reasons Mike and I started this company is we felt a strong, we have a strong belief that most individuals do not appreciate how they're getting charged when they buy an insurance product or when they buy an investment product. And the, it's one of the reasons the financial services industry is so uh, profitable because most people don't ask the question, right? They'll ask the question on you know Amazon, whether they got a good TV deal or not, but they won't ask the question about their mutual funds or, or their financial advisor. So we spend a lot of time talking about fees and expenses because it's a, 
and, and this is the reason why. Let's say you had $99,000 and you invested it for 30 years and you earned an 8% return on your money. Well, if you did that, you would have a million dollars at the end of the 30 years. But look what happens if you incurred a 2% fee a year on that investment. You would end up with 570000 versus a million. So almost half of your wealth is destroyed by paying that those fees. And, and that's, that's a huge deal and something that's not very much appreciated by individual investors is, is the effect of even just a small, seemingly small percent that's taken out every year from, uh, from the fee. So, so two issues, right? One is, you know, what is the fee? Most people don't know. And then two, even if they do know what the fee is, they don't really understand the effects that it has over a long period of time. Most people will just trust a financial advisor blindly and not ever ask the question. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about this. And this is one of the, when you're selecting an investment, the most important question is to ask, what are the fees? So he, let me summarize the first part of the uh, workshop. Number one, uh, there are no miracles. La Virgen de Guadalupe maybe appeared to Juan Diego uh, 500 years ago, but I can tell you that the Virgen de Guadalupe, Virgin Mary, does not appear in the world of money and investments. I think the goal of investing is to earn the highest return per unit level of risk. So you have to understand both sides of the equation. What are you earning and what risk are you taking? And is that appropriate? There are four buckets for investing. We talk, talked about the long-term money, the short-term money, the contra investment for the credit cards and the safety investment bucket. And then asset allocation, the mix of stocks, bonds, and cash is the most important decision before you make any decision. And we, we talked about those three. Real estate would also be another one that you would consider and you would model inside your, your allocation. Uh, careful with your bets against the market. Uh, and then fees are very important when selecting investments. So we got a couple minutes. Does anyone have any questions or like to make any comments um, regarding the first part of the workshop? And I can unmute you if you raise your hand. I can also, you can also chat and I can call it out to, uh, to the folks. Anyone? Anyone? Okay. We got the shy doctors in the house. All right. Um, let's talk about tax strategy. And Mike is on, on the line and he can talk a little bit about other issues that you may have. But let me give you a flavor again, an intuition. There's a lot to cover on taxes. Here's the bottom line. Why should you care? If you live in California uh, or another high tax rate state, you could be paying as much as 55% f uh, of, your, of your income to uh, taxing authorities. And that's a lot. Uh, if you compare that with 8% historical U.S. stock market return, this is why we spend a lot of time thinking about minimizing taxes because you know what? The effect on wealth, if you thought 2% was bad, try 55%. It's huge. Now, just like investing and fees, you can't avoid taxes, but you can definitely manage them. So let's get some basics, right? You know what? No one teaches you, not even in Harvard Business School, do you take a class on basics of taxes. You basically have two things, ordinary income and capital gains. Uh, the highest marginal tax rate for ordinary income could be around 43.4% if you include the Medicare uh, tax, uh, the Obamacare tax. And this is uh, you know, the most difficult one. It's on your salary, it's on your interest, on short-term capital gains. Capital gains could be on long-term, it's taxed actually lower. Most people it thinks it's 15%. It's actually a lot higher if you include everything. Uh, the net investment income tax, 
and you could be paying 23.8% to the federal. Um, so general rule, try to avoid ordinary income whenever possible. Hold investments for a year or longer to obtain lower capital gains rate. I want to talk about five strategies that we've implemented for our clients that will kind of drive this point uh, a, a little bit more uh, effectively, hopefully. So let's talk about the first strategy, maximizing contributions to tax deferred accounts. I'm going to show an example here. The most you can contribute to a 401k currently is about 17500 Let's say your marginal tax rate is 50%. So you're a high income earner because you know, you're a doctor or, or a lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, you, the way to think about that contribution to your 401k is that out of pocket, you're only making it $87.50 because otherwise you would have had to pay taxes on that money. And the other advantage is that you, you know, start with 17500 17, and it grows tax deferred. It's not taxed until much later when you take the money out at 59 and a half or even 70 and a half. It's the, the time you need to take out a 401k or an IRA. And sometimes, you know, in the corporate world, there's some company matching. What we recommend to our clients is that you maximize first and foremost, these types of accounts, because they're, you know, the, especially if you're in the high income tax bracket, which a lot of our clients are. There is no better way to save to for that bucket, number one, the long-term money than through these types of accounts. Now, if you're a small business owner, if you're a doctor, you could do a SEP IRA. I have a neighbor that contributed 51000 the max to that, and he, he invests exclusively, to, exclusively through there because of the tax savings. The other strategy uh, is to shift income to lower tax parties, right? So what does this mean? Again, you're trying to avoid or minimize the ordinary income. So let's talk about, you know, I have a couple kids and, and this is what I do, right? The, I have two kids. I have custodial accounts for each of them. And the first $950 of net investment income that my son and my daughter make each is taxed at a zero rate. That's just the kitty tax rule. It's not an issue. The second $950 is taxed at their rate. So my son Panchito, my daughter Isabella, they probably will pay about 10%. I am in the 50 plus percent tax bracket. So there's an arbitrage there by shifting some of the income that I make to them. And the way I do this is any time or at the end of the year, I look at my ETFs and my index funds and my stocks, any ones that have appreciated, I will put them under their name. I will gift them. And then in inside that account, I'll sell them and that, that that gain will be under their name and and these things can apply to them of course if it's more than 950 it gets taxed at my rate so this is a you know a clever strategy uh that you can shift income around if you have a lot of kids it works if you don't have kids well it doesn't work there's other things you can do but this is an example of that uh, strategy so let's talk about maximizing asset location so what do I mean by that? So the, the three types of accounts that folks generally have is they have an IRA, whether it be a Roth, SEP, uh, traditional, they have a 401k and a taxable account. So wh how you put the, where you put the assets, where you put the investments is very, very important and can add a lot of value. So for example, if you have taxable bonds in your portfolio, remember they shoot off, uh, remember that interest income is taxed at the highest marginal rate at ordinary income tax rates. So what you want to do is you want to put those in something like a tax deferred account, like an IRA 401k. If you have to have bonds in your taxable account, let's say you're in you know quadrant three liquidity fund, you want to have some bonds. For California clients, we recommend municipal bond funds because California municipal bond funds, they are not taxed at the federal level and they're not taxed at the California at the state level to California level. The the interest, at least, you know, if if, if you buy, let's say, a, a bond fund and it appreciates in value, then then you do have to pay some capital gains uh, rate uh, gain tax at, at some point. But the interest income, which is can be killer, is not taxed. And there's a lot of different things you can do uh, in with this strategy. For example. 
international stocks. You want to have them outside because if they uh, put out a dividend and, and the government in China takes part of that dividend, you can claim a foreign tax credit in your taxable account, but you can't really claim it on your IRA account because it's not being taxed. So there's you know, tons of chess playing strategies to, to shift things around, keep your asset allocation intact, but maximize the, the efficiency of your, of your investments. Mm-hmm. All right. So I uh, have a nonprofit organization called the Rising Farm Worker Dream Fund. I started it about 15 years ago, and I help sons and daughters of farm workers learn about business, learn about finance, and help themselves through, through that medium. It's a 501c3. And I would be giving money to my fellow farm workers, even if I didn't get a tax write-off. But because I am an investment advisor and I know some of this stuff, I try to maximize the heck out of my tax write-off when I do donate money. And this is how I do it. I donate appreciated investments. So how does that happen, right? Well, let me give you an example. Option A, I got $10,000 in cash. Because I'm in the 50% tax bracket, by giving $10,000 of my cash, I'm actually only giving $5,000 out of pocket because of that tax write-off. So that's a great deal, right? Out of pocket, $5,000, my foundation gets 10K. Great. I can help more students do more things. But let's say uh, I had a mutual fund or an investment uh, that had appreciated, that had gone up in value. And this is what happened, right? Mutual fund, I bought a mutual fund at a thousand bucks back in, you know, let's say 2005. And it's gone up to $10,000. So what's happening here? That mutual fund has a built in gain of 9,000 bucks. If I were to sell that today, I'd have to pay about 35% in taxes or or about $3,150 in taxes, okay? I would owe that money in combined federal and California taxes. But if I give it to my charity, not only do I avoid the $5,000 in ordinary income tax and taxes, but I also by avoiding the capital gain, the built-in tax liability, I get a $3,150 benefit. So essentially, I'm giving $10,000 to my charity, but I'm saving $8,150 in taxes. So that's a really, really effective way to leverage my dollar. And it's a very effective way. If you want to give the charity, almost every charity, major charity at least, has a brokerage account that you can easily transfer appreciated stock and appreciated investments uh, that will save you a lot in taxes, a lot more in taxes. And uh, now if it's 50 bucks or 100 bucks, it might not make sense or worth the trouble to do this. But if you're making large contributions of, say, maybe $500 or more, it might be worth your while to, to think about this strategy. So let's talk about this. And I, I save this and see if you're awake here something called harvesting tax losses. So this is a little bit of an advanced topic, but I thought I'd throw it in there. So this is how it works, right? Let's say I bought a mutual fund, call it X, in January of 2014. And in December, uh, so, you know, the stock market's going crazy, right? September right here, right? It's going nuts. And it goes up again and comes back to $100,000. So really, you know, I started with 100. I ended with 100. I still hold a mutual fund, not a big deal. Well, there is a big deal because instead of what I could have done is I could have sold that mutual fund and rebought something else that is not similar, not too similar to that fund, but acts in the same way. That's why I mean by rebuying the exposure. And I could have realized a $40,000 loss on the books, on my books. And I could have done that here as well. Instead of 60, I could have sold it and got this $20,000 loss. So now I have $60,000 of losses on paper for future taxes. And the way it works is I can take out of that $60,000 that I realized, I can take $3,000 and offset my ordinary income. 
So that to me is $1,500 in my pocket. I can also take those losses and offset capital gains I have somewhere else. Like if a stock did go up and I sold it. So there's a monetary benefit by harvesting tax losses. I mean, I wrote an article about this, explains the detail. But essentially what it's doing is you're when there's dips uh, in the stock market, like today, like yesterday, you sell what you have, you rebuy it in a different form that doesn't trigger like a wash sale rule. And I'll, I'll explain that later. But you buy a different mutual fund and you get those losses for future use. And it makes a lot of sense. Advanced topic, read the article that I wrote on it. I will send it with the, with the summary. So here's, here's a summary on, on tax strategy. The takeaway is, look, taxes are a big deal. You know, this is not a political debate whether, you know, the rich are paying their fair share. But this, all I'm saying is taxes are one of the most significant destroyers of wealth around. Whether good or bad, that, that's not the argument. The argument is they're a very big deal. In California, they can be as high as 55%. The other point that I want to drive, and this is why we formed the form, the, the company that we did, is that any investment decision that you make will almost always have some kind of tax angle and tax implication. And understanding that, whether it's you're harvesting losses, you're putting bonds in your 401k, or you're donating appreciated stocks to charity, it's important to understand how it affects your overall tax exposures. And it's important, and not a lot of folks do this. The other, uh, you know, the, the some of the strategies that we talked about is maximizing tax deferred accounts like 401ks and SEP IRS, shifting income to lower tax parties like children, donating appreciated investments, and then that crazy topic about harvesting tax losses.